Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 70, Galba and Otho. So the history of Rome is now married and settled into our new global headquarters in Austin, Texas. It was an eventful break, and the last few weeks saw some pretty major changes in my life. As fun as it all was, though, I'm eager to get back to the comfortable weekly rhythm of the show, so without further ado, let's get to it. You'll remember that in early 68 AD, Gaius Julius Vindex, governor of one of the Gallic provinces, rose up in revolt against Nero. Vindex tried to convince old Servius Sulpicius Galba, governor of the largest province in Spain, to join him and lead a wider rebellion, but Galba refused to commit to the fight and Vindex's revolt was put down by Lucius Virginius Rufus, commander of the legions on the Upper Rhine. But the legions on the Rhine were not driven by any deep love for Nero, and having defeated Vindex, they tried to convince Virginius himself to lead them all in rebellion against Nero. But Virginius refused. Though Vindex's rebellion was technically put down and Virginius remained loyal, these events signaled to the empire that Nero's star was fading fast, and that it was time to flee from the sinking ship. In Rome, the Praetorian prefect Nathidius Sabinus told his men that if they abandoned Nero and supported the aforementioned Galba, that the old governor of Spain would pay them all off handsomely. Galba had said no such thing, but he had decided that the time to break publicly with Nero was at hand. With every important commander turning on the emperor, the Senate seized the opportunity to be rid of Nero, declared him a public enemy, and called for his execution a fate Nero escaped only by committing suicide. With Nero dead, the Senate sent word that they were ready to recognize Galba as the new Caesar. In just a few short months, Galba had gone from a provincial governor contemplating retirement to absolute ruler of the Roman Empire. All that was left to do was march on Rome and assume the throne. I think that that is about where we left off. Galba's brief reign as emperor would be stormy, to say the least. The storm was in part his own fault, both for things he had done in the past and things he would do now that he was in power. But the fact is that Otho was able to find murderous accomplices within the ranks of the Praetorian Guard, not because of what Galba was doing per se, but because Galba refused to keep promises that Galba had never actually made. From the moment it looked like sticking with Nero would be suicide, Nymphidius Sabinus had been promising all kinds of riches to the troops under his command if they backed Galba. The prefect made all these promises as if he was simply relaying messages received from Galba, but mostly he was just telling whoppers and hoping that they would come true later. I think that probably most Roman politicians in Galba's shoes, arriving in Rome to news that the Praetorians were expecting X amount as a donative, would have felt compelled to pay the money, but Galba was a peculiar bird and a world-class miser. He scoffed at Sabinus's promises and then naively went about his business as if canceling the bonuses would have no serious consequences. Of course, by this point, Sabinus had already been murdered by his own men, so maybe Galba figured that everyone understood that anything the prefect had said was now moot. But I am getting a bit ahead of myself. Galba did not immediately leave for Rome in the days following his ascension. He was, after all, still governor of a rich and independent-minded province. He had to make sure that Spain would not fall apart when its longtime administrator suddenly left on more important business. He lingered for a month, raising a new legion to accompany him on the march to Rome and finding the right man to take over governance of the province. As an aside, the man Galba chose to succeed him signaled Galba's priorities, or more accurately, the priorities of his three advisors, Vinius, Laco and Icelus, when it came to appointing governors. Cluvius Rufus was a well-respected senator, but a man with no military experience. It was a mold that Galba would use for other key provincial appointments, most notably Vitellius's eventual command of the legions on the Lower Rhine. The three pedagogues had no intention of putting experienced military men at the head of large armies. That was, after all, how they had just come to power, and they weren't about to let anyone else repeat the process. Galba finally shoved off for Rome in July, but was soon met by a delegation from the Senate, bringing news that things in the capital were getting out of hand. Galba's continued absence from the city had allowed the ambitions of Sabinus to grow at an exponential rate. The Praetorian prefect had apparently decided that it was no longer enough to simply back a new emperor. He now actually wanted to be that new emperor. <laughs> 
To that end, Sabinus had begun passing around a rumor that he was actually the son of Caligula, and thus the rightful Julio-Claudian heir to Nero. But Sabinus hung himself before Galba or the Senate had a chance to respond. Already somewhat ashamed of themselves for having turned on Nero so readily, a good chunk of the guard was mortally offended that Sabinus was now calling on them to abandon Galba before the latter even had a chance to arrive in Rome. Were they really such a dishonorable lot that their loyalties would simply shift at the slightest breeze? When Sabinus arrived at the Praetorian camp, ready to accept the title of Caesar, he was instead greeted by an angry mob. They allowed their prefect through the gate, and then they locked the door behind him. Sabinus did not make it out of the camp alive. Honor aside, there was really no reason to turn on Galba just yet anyway. After all, there was the matter of that huge bonus they had been promised. The case of the missing donative, as I said, was a landmine that the unsuspecting Galba would eventually step on, but in his defense, it was at least a landmine laid by someone else. On his march from Spain to Rome, though, Galba did plenty enough damage to his own reputation without anyone else's help. When he finally got to Italy and stepped on the mine that was laid by Sabinus, Galba was already politically wounded enough that rather than just knock him around some, the blast would actually be enough to finally kill him. There are a couple of schools of thought about how best to ascend to the throne following a coup-like situation. One is embodied by Julius Caesar, who was forever pardoning his enemies and exuding a spirit of such generosity and forgiveness that you couldn't help but love the guy. The other was embodied by Octavian, who ruthlessly purged all his enemies so that when he seized power, he could play the part of enlightened despot without fear of counter-revolution. Galba followed the path of Octavian, but did so without the slightest hint of political savvy or decency. In Roman society, it was one thing to kill your enemies. It was quite another to kill their wives and children. It was one thing to execute a few troublemakers within an unruly legion. It was quite another to slaughter entire cohorts just beyond the walls of Rome because you don't like their attitude. When he left Spain, Galba was seen as a wise and experienced leader capable of saving the empire from the excesses of Nero. But by the time he arrived in Rome, he was seen as an inflexible and cruel tyrant. As Tacitus says, everyone agreed that Galba would make an excellent emperor until he actually became emperor. The dastardly crime of killing wives and children came early on as Galba consolidated his hold over Spain. Governors and procurators in the region who did not immediately offer their full-throated support for the new Caesar were rounded up along with their families and murdered. The indecency of this purge was at first missed in all the confusion, but word of what had happened would trail Galba on his trip to Rome and then linger as further proof that the increasingly disliked Galba was in fact a monster. The new emperor exacerbated the situation by treating towns he passed as enemy fortresses if they did not immediately submit to his authority. Otherwise perfectly loyal and peaceful settlements were sacked by Galba's men, who acted like a conquering army on the march through enemy territory. Galba arrived at the outskirts of Rome in October, and by that time, everyone knew what a swath he had cut across the Western Empire. The Romans braced themselves to greet their savior. But before he set foot in the city, Galba blasted out the final chunk of what was left of his reputation. Prior to committing suicide, Nero had raised a new legion, composed mostly of ex-marines and sailors. In the hierarchy of the Roman armed forces, Marines and sailors were a barely acknowledged necessity, whereas full legionnaires were respected and granted all sorts of privileges. Not wanting to give up their so recently acquired bump in status, soldiers from the new legion greeted Galba at the Milvian Bridge and demanded that he legalize their promotions. Galba ordered them to disperse, but they refused, which Galba took to be nothing less than rank insubordination and possibly treason. When a few in the petitioning legion drew their swords to show that they meant business, Galba snapped and ordered his legion to attack. This was not simply meant to be a terrifying display of force. Galba was deadly serious, and in the ensuing massacre, thousands from the new legion were killed. When the fighting stopped, Galba rounded up the survivors and decided to revive the long-since discarded practice of decimation, whereby one out of every ten men was selected by lots and put to death. <laughs> 
The punished legion was in shock at having to submit to this archaic and cruel punishment. Galba's own men were disgusted by the display, and the people of Rome were horrified. Galba simply stated that he was acting well within the bounds of military law, and though he was right on the statutory point, politically he could not have been more wrong. When he finally entered the city, Galba was a feared and hated man. After just a few months in office, he was so thoroughly despised that it's a wonder he even lasted into the middle of January. It's not that Galba wasn't trying. It was just that he had the political instincts of a lemming and couldn't stop running headlong over the nearest cliff. The one and only major issue he tackled during his reign was trying to clean up the empire's finances, and he bungled that so badly that even his most ardent supporters conceded that Galba was not well suited for his new position. Nero had left an enormous financial mess to clean up, and the people likely would have given Galba the benefit of the doubt as he tried to wade through it all, but the new emperor pursued such a tone-deaf cleanup operation that whatever goodwill he had coming to him was immediately squandered. Though, in the end, responsibility for the majority of his ill-advised plans has been laid squarely at the feet of the three pedagogues, the buck, as they say, stopped with Galba at the time. Taking their first look at the official books, Galba and his advisors quickly understood the severity of the situation. Nero had effectively cleaned out the state reserves and left the empire essentially broke. Knowing that the vast majority of the funds had been spent either building the Golden Palace or been handed out to court favorites its gifts, Galba decided to simply recover the dispersed funds. But as the treasury officials knocked on doors looking for the money, it became clear that most of it had already been spent by those who had received it. In many cases, the money had been spent on a variety of gifts that the court favorites had issued to clients as part of the patronage system that defined Roman political life. So, while the money itself quickly became untraceable, the purchased items themselves were cataloged and pursued by the treasury officials. Galba's officers soon found themselves ordered to seize property from families who had acquired the goods in question blamelessly. Thus, rather than coming down hard on Nero's old accomplices, the burden was borne by men only tangentially related to the emperor's excesses. This, as you can imagine, was not a very popular policy. The larger plan was to auction off the seized property to re-raise the cash that had been lost. But with so much economic uncertainty, even if they could afford to, no one wanted to bid on the seized items, and the auction raised next to nothing. To make matters worse, the two men who made out best in the auctions were Vinius and Icellus, who picked up all manner of property for pennies on the dollar. This only reinforced the idea that the whole operation had been masterminded by Galba's fiendish advisors, who control the senile old fool completely, don't you know, to make themselves rich at everyone else's expense. The whole thing was a public relations nightmare, but Galba either didn't understand how much ill will he was stirring up, or he simply didn't care. The topper to all this was that while the new imperial administration was running around seizing everyone's property and auctioning it off to itself, Galba was announcing that there was not enough money to restore the free grain allotments that had been suspended by Nero following the Great Fire. The shuttering of the grain allotments had been a grievance the poor had been nursing for the last few years, and with Nero now gone, they fully expected Galba to get the grain flowing again. This one-two punch left the new emperor virtually friendless. The upper and middle classes hated him for arbitrarily seizing their legally obtained property, while the lower classes hated him for denying the free grain allotment. Having already alienated most of the legions with his heavy-handed discipline, especially the legions on the Rhine, which we'll cover in greater detail next week, Galba was fast running out of allies. But at least he still had the Praetorians on his side. As long as an emperor has that final line of protection, there is little anyone can do to stop him from doing whatever he wants. Oh, what's that you say? The Praetorians were actually among the first to get super ticked off at Galba? Well, I guess he's in real trouble then, huh? The problem with the Praetorians, as I mentioned, was that earlier in the year, Nymphidius Sabinus had promised them a huge payout if they abandoned Nero and backed Galba. But of course, Galba had never authorized such a promise, and never in a million years would have paid what was, in effect, a massive bribe. As I said in episode 68, 
Galba believed in the chain of command almost to a fault. A commander did not purchase the loyalty of his troops. He commanded, and they obeyed. Period. But even discarding the specific promises made by Sabinus, Galba's decision not to pay out a donative to the Praetorians upon his ascension broke with an accepted practice that dated back to Tiberius. It was considered a goodwill gesture to get the new administration off on the right foot. Galba, though, not only refused to pay the sum promised by Sabinus, but he refused to pay any sum at all. The Praetorians were incensed at being denied what they considered to be their rightful payout. But Galba refused to reconsider his position. That may have been the way the Julio-Claudians operated, but the Julio-Claudians were dead and gone. Galba was intent on founding a new dynasty, one based on honor and duty, not crass self-interest and purchased loyalty. Which brings us to the last decision Galba would make as emperor. One old man does not a dynasty make. From the moment the childless Galba had been declared Caesar, the question on everybody's mind was who he would choose to be his heir and successor. Every semi-influential man of senatorial rank believed that he deserved the prize, but one man, above all the others, was really super convinced that he was going to get the nod. Marcus Salvius Otho. Having supported Galba from the beginning and having accompanied the new emperor on his march to Rome, Otho was already making plans for what he would do once he became emperor. As I mentioned a few episodes ago, adding to Otho's confidence was a recently taken astrological forecast that basically said, Galba will soon be dead and you will succeed him. Plus, on a less abstract level, Otho had made a deal with Vinius that locked the influential advisor into backing Otho's bid in exchange for Otho marrying Vinius' sister once the adoption went through. But as 68 became 69 AD, Galba still had not made up his mind. Reports started coming in that there was some unrest within the legions on the Rhine, and that possibly they were in full revolt. Probably nothing to worry about. The same thing had happened when Tiberius had ascended to the throne. All Tiberius had to do was send his son out to talk some sense into them, so maybe Galba should just... Oh, wait, the old man still hasn't chosen a successor yet. Galba had been taking his time with the decision to make sure he got it right, or possibly because with everything else that was going on, he simply didn't have the time or energy to focus on the issue of succession. But when word came that the legions on the Rhine were in full mutiny, Galba decided that he needed to reassure the empire that the center of power was and would remain in Rome, not in the legionary camps on the Rhine. Behind closed doors, he met with his advisors. Vinius, of course, argued in favor of Otho, while Aichelius and Laco backed a man named Cornelius Dorabella. But this seems to be one of the few occasions that Galba acted on his own, and, dissatisfied with both candidates, he announced that he would be adopting a man named Lucius Calpurnius Piso, a man of impeccable breeding who had spent the majority of Nero's reign in exile and had only recently been recalled to Rome. Piso was brought into the meeting and informed that he was now officially the heir of Galba. The three pedagogues were shocked and annoyed when Piso took the announcement in calm stride. Clearly, Piso was not himself a power-hungry man, and they didn't much like the idea of having to serve someone who lacked the kind of avarice and ambition they could really exploit. Bad for business, you know? When Galba made his decision public, it is important to note that he did not make his speech to the Senate or to a mass gathering of the people, but rather to a hastily called meeting of the Praetorian Guard. Galba apparently thought that this deference to the guard would make up for the missing donative that he had never paid. But the short speech introducing Piso, which Galba gave on January 10, went over like a lead balloon. There was still no word on the missing bonus, which the guard had not forgotten, and, adding insult to injury, there was no talk of the additional bonus which usually accompanied births, weddings, adoptions, and other happy occasions. On top of all that, Otho had been making the rounds within the Praetorians for months, gaining their trust and confidence by dispersing huge sums of cash and hinting that there would be more where that came from once he finally became the heir apparent. So everyone was expecting generous and charismatic Otho, and what they got was a humorless exile who seemed no more inclined to buy their love than Galba. Needless to say, the cheers greeting the arrival of Piso were less than enthusiastic.
When Otho found out he had been passed over, he was livid. So livid, in fact, that he quickly gave himself over to a murderous rage that came boiling up to the surface. He was embarrassed and he was angry. But more than that, he was deeply in debt and had been borrowing heavily against the understanding that he would soon be Galba's heir and eventually emperor in his own right. The minute Otho found out he was not going to be the heir was the minute Otho realized that his many, many creditors would soon be beating down his door. Otho himself is reported to have joked darkly that unless he became emperor, it would not matter whether he was found by his enemies on the battlefield or found by his creditors in the forum. The result would be the same. His life passing before his eyes, Otho turned to extreme measures and immediately began plotting to assassinate both Galba and Piso. With the last few dollars he could scrape together, Otho purchased the service of 23 Praetorian guardsmen. Tacitus mentions that had Galba even given a perfunctory sum to the guard upon his ascension, it is unlikely that any of them would have turned so readily. But that ship had now sailed. Otho came with money and promises, whereas Galba had shown himself disdainful of both. Knowing that they had to act fast to avoid discovery, the conspirators were ready to go on January 15, just five days after the introduction of Piso. That morning, Otho, along with the rest of the Senate, paid their respects to Galba at a religious ceremony held at the Temple of Apollo, adjacent to the Imperial Palace. At the arranged hour, an accomplice fetched Otho from the proceedings with the cover story that a realtor needed to talk to him about a potential home sale. Otho left the ceremony and hurried to meet his accomplices in the forum. With the rest of the ruling class occupied with Galba's ceremony, Otho rushed the Praetorian camp. The conspirators pushed their way past the camp gatekeeper and called for the Praetorians to muster so Otho could address them. The officers were wary of what was unfolding, but the common soldiers were eager to hear what Otho had to say. Playing up their every grievance, Otho reminded them of the disrespect Galba had repeatedly shown, not just to them, but to every common soldier he had ever led. Otho assured his audience that all the provincial legions hated Galba and that the Senate and people of Rome both would gladly be rid of the mean old man if only someone would act in their name. There was no time to waste, Otho cried. They must now, right now, strike a blow for the empire. Having worked the soldiers into a frenzied mix of self-interest and grand idealism, Otho ordered a cohort of cavalry out of the camp to find the hated Galba and kill him. Meanwhile, the morning ceremony had wrapped up and Galba was getting down to the day's business when frantic word came of what was happening in the Praetorian camp. Confusion reigned as rumor after counter-rumor poured into the palace. At one point, a soldier arrived and, lying through his teeth for whatever reason, announced that he had taken care of the situation by personally killing Otho. At this, Galba displayed his customary disdain for individual initiative. Rather than congratulating the soldier, Galba asked harshly who had ordered him to kill Otho. Unsure, though, now of whether Otho was dead or alive, a heated debate between Galba's advisors ensued on whether to lock down the palace and hole up or ride out to meet this treasonous challenge to imperial authority. Galba finally settled on the latter course. Donning a breastplate, he climbed into his imperial litter and was carried out into the forum, accompanied by a collection of bodyguards, the three pedagogues, and his adopted son Piso. Before he could make it to the Praetorian camp, though, Galba was met by the charging cavalrymen. No one knew how dire the situation really was until the cavalry ignored all calls to halt and simply charged headlong into Galba's party. The litter was knocked to the ground, and before Galba could rise, he was stabbed to death. Laco and Aichelus managed to flee, but Vinius was caught and killed, despite his protests, possibly indicating his complicity in the plot, that Otho had not ordered his death. Piso also managed to flee the scene, but was cornered in the Temple of the Vestas and killed. The heads of both Galba and Piso were delivered to Otho, who allowed them to be kicked around for sport by the soldiers now under his command. Galba was murdered at the age of 70, having served as emperor for just over seven months, by far the shortest tenure in office since the inception of the Principate. It was a record, however, that would not last long.
Otho, who would accept the title of both Caesar and Augustus after they were foisted upon him by the Praetorians and then confirmed by the Senate within hours of the coup, would wind up wearing the purple for half that long. On April 15, just three months after taking office, Otho would commit suicide in his tent after being defeated by Vitellius's invading Rhine legions. Next week, we will get into how Vitellius, one of the most unlikely candidates for emperor in Roman history, found himself leading the Western Empire in revolt, and what Otho did in the few months he reigned to try to stamp it out. I will close this week by extending my deep, deep appreciation for all the donations that have come in over the last few weeks. You guys are amazing. The now Mrs. History of Rome and I are blown away by your generosity. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 71, Otho and Vitellius. On January 15, 69 AD, Otho assassinated Galba and fulfilled the prophecy that had been driving the young aristocrat for the past few months, that Galba would soon be dead and Otho would succeed him. Of course, Otho had been working under the assumption that the prophecy meant Galba would adopt him and he would ascend to the throne legitimately. But having been passed over for adoption, Otho fulfilled the prophecy by other means, violent, illegitimate means. Otho, however, was not the only one who had an eye on the throne, nor the only one who was willing to go to violent, illegitimate lengths to seize it. In the weeks leading up to his death, Galba had been receiving reports that the legions on the Rhine, ostensibly led by Vitellius, were in full revolt. In public, Galba downplayed the danger and brushed aside worries that something was seriously amiss in the north, but when Otho finally claimed his prize and became the supreme ruler of the Roman Empire, he discovered that it was not a unified state he inherited. Not only was the revolt along the Rhine much more serious than anyone thought, it would prove to be the only issue Otho would deal with as emperor. Whatever plans he had, and whatever dreams he dreamed, for the rest of his short life, Otho would be consumed with beating back the insurrection in the north, and ultimately wind up dying in the attempt. Otho had apparently been so focused on asking the prophets when he would be emperor that he forgot to ask them for how long he would be emperor, because the answer would have been not very long, and maybe then he would have thought twice about the whole project. The funny thing is that the revolt that would eventually take Otho down had nothing to do with Otho himself. It was actually a revolt against Galba, but when word came north that Galba was dead, well, Everyone was so revved up already that the treasonous event horizon was now in the rearview mirror. Nothing less than total capitulation on Otho's part would have averted their planned invasion of Italy. Along the Rhine, the rebellious pot started boiling in the wake of Vindex's revolt. As you know, Virginius Rufus, leading the legions on the upper Rhine, put down the revolt and then refused his troops' offer to declare him imperator. The Rhine legions went back to their camps and continued their nominal support of Nero at the behest of their obviously popular commander. However, when Galba came to power, things began to get ugly. For one thing, Galba had obviously been on the side of Vindex, even if he had never come to the latter's aid. So when he marched through Gaul on his way from Spain to Italy, Galba went out of his way to praise and reward the local tribes that had risen up along with Vindex. This support came at the expense of the tribes that had fought with the Rhine legions against the insurrection. Galba then compounded this slight by ignoring the Rhine soldiers themselves when it came to doling out honors and rewards. He did not punish any of them, but it was clear that Galba was stiffing them on his way into office. When the local auxiliaries and camp legionnaires got together and compared notes, they discovered that for the high crime of doing their duty, they had all been given the shaft. This, coupled with Galba's lingering reputation in the region from his tour there during Caligula's reign, meant that it was only with great difficulty that the commanders were able to convince the men to accept Galba as their legitimate emperor. 
but they never did accept Galba in their hearts. Virginius was replaced by someone Galba could trust, a decision that only exacerbated the situation. Fontius Capito, the commander of the Lower Rhine, was soon implicated in a plot to overthrow Galba and was killed by the two officers who discovered his treachery. The assassination of Capito is what led Galba to appoint the totally harmless and utterly inexperienced Vitellius as a replacement, presumably to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. But the thing about the Capito affair is that there is a great deal of plausible speculation that Capito was not fomenting revolution, that instead he had refused to go along with the plot of the two officers who eventually killed him. Because one of those officers, Fabius Valens, had a great deal to do with convincing the supposedly harmless Vitellius that he could be emperor and to lead the Rhine armies in revolt. The other major influence on Vitellius was Aulus Caecina, who had served in Spain and was an early supporter of Galba. As a reward, he was able to skip a few places up the chain of command and was appointed legate of one of the legions on the Upper Rhine. But the young, charismatic, and well-liked Caecina was also ambitious and greedy. Not long after taking up his new post, he was accused of embezzling funds and had every reason to fear that old stick-in-the-mud Galba would soon strip him of his command, or worse. As eager and opportunist as the world has ever known, Caecina determined that the only way he was escaping his predicament in one piece was to stoke the resentment of the men under his command and hopefully convince them that as the cream of the Roman legions, which everyone agreed they were, that they deserved an emperor who showed them the proper respect. Caecina's motivation, then, in leading a revolution is clear he was facing possible execution if Galba remained emperor. Valens's motivation, though, is far less clear, and he seems to simply be an unscrupulous commander nearing the end of an undistinguished career who felt that he had been treated badly by the new emperor and saw a chance to pole vault his way into power and relevancy. Perhaps it was simply a love of intrigue for intrigue's sake. However it happened, when the new year came around, both men were ready to throw off Galba's so recently saddled yoke. On the 1st of January, the provincial legions renewed their solemn oaths to protect and defend the empire for the greater glory of the empire in whose name yada yada yada. This is supposed to be a mere formality, but at the prodding of Caecina, two legions on the Upper Rhine refused to re-up their commitment. Despite the efforts of the few officers present who remained loyal to the emperor, the mutinous soldiers toppled statues of Galba brought in for the ceremony. Rather than swearing an oath to the emperor, the men swore allegiance to the Senate and the people of Rome and declared their intention to overthrow the usurper Galba for the sake of, you know, liberty and stuff. With this initial spark struck, things happened fast. Situated in what is today Cologne, Vitellius learned of the mutiny, But rather than immediately making preparations to put the clamp down on it, as would have been expected, he instead sent around word to his commanders that either they were going to have to march north and fight their comrades, or join in the mutiny themselves and declare their own emperor to take Galba's place. Valens, who had no doubt spent the last few months whispering in Vitellius's ear, was the first commander to arrive in Cologne with his decision. He hailed Vitellius as imperator. Vitellius accepted the salute, and just like that, the revolt was off to the races. By the 2nd or 3rd of January, all the legions on the Rhine, probably the most formidable fighting force in the empire, had committed themselves to war with Galba. Except that they never would get their war with Galba. Two weeks after Vitellius had been declared imperator by his men, word came that Galba had been assassinated and that Otho was the new emperor. But by this point, events along the Rhine had gone way beyond simple revenge. The commanders had the brass ring in their sights, and their men saw no downside in moving forward until the whole empire was theirs to gorge themselves on. Life in a legionary camp along the Rhine River was no picnic. So when they learned that the man who had gotten them all fired up in the first place was dead, well, unless Otho planned to step aside in favor of Vitellius when they all arrived in Rome, the new emperor was in the same place as the old emperor, namely, in their way. Back in Rome, Otho arrived at the palace following his coup and began running through Galba's personal correspondence. Mostly boring stuff, taxes, petitions, favors, and, hello, what's this? 
The Rhine legions are in full revolt, have declared Vitellius emperor, and are readying to march on Rome? Well, I think I know what I'm doing today. Otho first attempted to reason with Vitellius, and the two engaged in an increasingly acrimonious correspondence that had both promising money, influence, and property in exchange for the other abandoning his illegitimate claim to the throne. Neither backed down, and the negotiations, if they could even be described as such, went nowhere. Otho had the support of the Praetorian Guard and the Senate in Rome, and assurances from governors across the Central and Eastern Empire that they backed him. But unfortunately, all of this amounted to very little when it came to countering an invasion from the north. At his immediate disposal, Otho had the Praetorian cohorts, the remains of the legion Galba had decimated, and a collection of parade-ready soldiers used mostly for show. While he corresponded with Vitellius, Otho conscripted around 2,000 gladiators and gathered up an undefined number of cavalry, but nothing he had on hand would be able to stand a chance against what Vitellius was sending south. Otho's only hope lay in the Balkans, and he ordered the legions stationed there to pack up their winter camps and head forthwith to northern Italy. Otho was hoping to join with them and then march through the Alps to face down Vitellius before the latter could reach Italy. But by the middle of February, his intelligence reported that the Vitellian forces were already on the march. While Vitellius stayed behind to oversee the now dangerously under garrison border with Germania, Valens and Caecina each led separate columns south. Valens was to come in from the west and Caecina the east. Quickly, Otho abandoned the idea of marching through the Alps and determined that he would need to make his stand at the Po River. He ordered the forces at his disposal, maybe 10,000 troops, to march north to the Po Valley and delay the advancing battalions long enough for the Balkan reinforcements to arrive. At the same time, Otho sent a maritime force up the western coast of Italy to Gaul. The idea seems to have been for this navy to attack the local coastal communities aligned with Vitellius, hopefully forcing Valens, leading the larger of the two columns, to halt his march and come to their aid. If this was in fact the plan, there is some debate about what exactly this maritime expedition was actually up to, they were moderately successful. They raised enough hell that Valens broke off a detachment from his column to defend the communities, and a brief battle was fought, the first of what was now officially a civil war, near a place known as the Forum Julii. The Othonian forces won the initial encounter, but were driven back after a counterattack. The two sides then hunkered down in a mutual stalemate. This opening encounter of the war was inconclusive, but ultimately irrelevant, as it slowed Valens down little and occurred outside of what would prove to be the main eastern theater of the war. On that front, helped by a mild winter and a smaller force, Caecina was making much faster progress south. Though Caecina and Valens were technically on the same side, the two detested each other and were engaged in a fierce, if unspoken, competition to reach Italy first, defeat Otho first, and enter Rome first. The official plan was for them to cross the Alps at the same time and meet up on the other side, but Caecina paid no attention to this and plowed ahead regardless of where Valens might be at. He emerged into northern Italy in March and went to work securing everything north of the Po River. A detachment of Otho's advance force already occupied the important city of Placentia on the southern banks of the Po, so Caecina took up residence in Cremona on the northern bank. Prudence dictated that Caecina hold Cremona and wait for Valens, but believing that his veterans would make short work of Otho's outnumbered and soft parade units, Caecina decided to immediately take Placentia by force. But in two days of intense fighting, Otho's forces successfully repelled the assault, forcing Caecina to abandon the attempt. The rest of the advanced Othonian army had been encamped at Verona, awaiting the imminent arrival of the Balkan legions. Indeed, an advance force of about 2,000 had already arrived. But when they heard of the assault on Placentia, they rushed to relieve their comrades. But before they could arrive, Caecina had already been beaten off, so they set up camp at Bedriacum, about 30 miles east of Cremona on the north side of the river. Humiliated by his defeat at Placentia and hoping to regain the upper hand before Valens arrived, Caecina schemed up an ambush he hoped would help him do just that. Leading a small detachment of infantry and cavalry, 
down the road between Cremona and Bedriacum. He hid the infantry in the trees alongside the road, and then sent out the cavalry to engage in one of the oldest military tricks in the book. Attack the enemy's camp, pretend to be driven off, and lead the pursuing force into a trap. Caecina expected this to be a morale booster more than anything else, but things quickly got out of hand. The Othonian forces had already learned of Caecina's plan by way of Vitellian deserters. So when Caecina's cavalry arrived, the Othonians marched out in full force, now somewhere north of 13,000 troops, to overwhelm the trap. Though Caecina was tricked into attacking what he soon discovered to be the entire opposing army, delays and hassles trying to properly form up the mostly rookie Othonian troops allowed Caecina to call in reinforcements and extract himself from the debacle. By the time of the failed ambush, Valens had arrived on the Italian side of the Alps, though he was still a good 50 miles from the action. When word came of the events at Placentia and Caecina's failed ambush, his army double-timed it to meet up with their comrades. The forced march, though, interestingly, was not actually Valens's idea. His troops, believing Valens to be dragging his feet and slowing the column down on purpose, literally marched off without him, forcing him to hurry to catch up. At this point, discipline in all of the armies was something of a joke. Prior to the ambush, a mutiny in the Othonian camp at Bedriacum, triggered by the men's belief that their commanders were insufficiently committed to the war, was headed off only when Otho sent his own brother, whose commitment could not be questioned, to take on overall command. During the ambush, a mutiny had broken out among Caecina's troops back in Cremona, because they believed that their commanders were refusing to send them out in full force to relieve their comrades because they wanted to hang Caecina out to dry. Valens, meanwhile, endured one mutiny on his march that required him to slip out of the camp in slaves' clothes, and then obviously a second one when his army disobeyed his orders and marched to Caecina's defense. Much is made of the notion that throughout the year of the four emperors, the common soldiers were running amok, and their commanders were simply trying to keep up. Much of this is probably overblown, but there is no denying that for this period of the war between Vitellius and Otho, the soldiers clearly did not trust their commanders, and for a while, the cart really did seem to be leading the horse. In the middle of March, Otho himself finally left Rome at the head of another six to 9,000 troops. The emperor settled with his accompanying forces in the town of Brixellum, about 15 miles from Bedriacum, where he too waited for the Balkan reinforcements. Soon enough, the first of these legions arrived. But by the time they showed up, Caecina's assault on Placentia had failed and his ambush exposed as a non-starter. The Othonian army was eager to finish off what they saw as a fatally demoralized army. Was there really any need to wait for the rest of the Balkan troops? Even the arrival of Valens was not enough to put them off. With the casualties Caecina had suffered trying to take Placentia and the arrival of Otho's force and the new Balkan legion, the two sides were now of approximately equal strength. By the middle of April, the ball was clearly in Otho's court about what the next move would be. The Vitellians, meanwhile, were holed up in Cremona, hoping that the inexperienced Otho, his five feuding generals and their inexperienced legions, would make a crucial mistake that they could exploit. Otho traveled to Bedriacum to hold a council of war, where the generals debated whether to attack now or wait for a more opportune moment. It seems, though, that the decision to attack at once had already been made, and that despite their valid arguments that it would be best to perhaps wait for the rest of the Balkan legions, those in favor of delay were seen as being overly timid and possibly working to undermine the Othonian effort. Delay, it was argued, meant losing the initiative and allowing Vitellius to send his own reinforcements. The only real open question was whether Otho would lead his army personally or return to the safety of Brixellum. It was finally decided that the emperor would follow precedent and remove himself from the field. If things went badly and he was out of harm's way, he would still be a rallying point and able to direct a counterattack. But if things went badly and he was in the thick of the battle, well, the death of Otho meant the death of the whole operation, as he had no heir and had not yet named a successor. 
The decision to fight itself was not the fatal mistake the Vitellians had been waiting for. But the way Otho's generals executed the decision most certainly was. Bedriacum was only about 30 miles from Cremona, but it took the Othonians two full days to reach the city. The delay gave Otho fits as he sent dispatch after dispatch demanding to know why in the hell they had not attacked yet. To make matters worse, on that second day, the Othonian generals, particularly Otho's brother, were not prepared for battle at all. Convinced that the battalions would remain sequestered in Cremona, he tried to lead the Othonian army around the city to a spot five miles past Cremona, where they would make camp and then finally, on day three, goad the battalions into attack. But when Valens and Caecina saw the Othonians sort of rambling towards them, with all their baggage and carts and equipment weighing them down, they figured that now was the perfect opportunity to attack. So they did just that. Totally unprepared, the Othonians lined up in confused order when the full Vitellian army suddenly appeared on the horizon. Both sides were able to set themselves, and initially the battle was little more than a series of skirmishes. But then the two lines crashed into each other, and the armies got down to business. Though everyone comments that the untried Othonians fought far better than anyone could have expected, first their left flank and then their right were overrun. The Othonians broke and fled back to the safety of their camp at Bedriacum. The survivors spent the night trying to figure out what to do next. The Praetorians present wanted to keep fighting, but everybody else was ready to surrender. A delegation was sent to meet with Caecina and Valens to work out the terms. Otho received news of the defeat from survivors staggering into Brixellum that same evening. Though he still had reinforcements on the way, their loyalty was nominal at best. So despite the protests of the Praetorians surrounding him, Otho determined straight away that he had taken his one shot and missed. He could not in good conscience prolong a war that would only see more Roman blood spilt. He dispersed what money he had, encouraged his supporters to flee from the oncoming Vitellian wrath, and then went to bed, his mind firmly made up. If right now he was seen as a villain for having seized the throne violently and then engaging in a war against his fellow countrymen, let future generations see him as a nobleman who died to stop the slaughter. On the morning of April 16th, he woke up early and stabbed himself in the heart. He was 36 years old and had ruled Rome, well, some of it anyway, for almost exactly three months. Though his suicide did indeed endear him to future generations, who came to see Otho's noble death as one of the most virtuous in the whole long history of the empire, it would only stop the bloodshed for a short while. For many Romans, while Otho may have been a murderous usurper, Vitellius was a crass and unworthy man who had used the armies entrusted to him to engage in full-blown civil war without soliciting the Senate or the people's approval. Vitellius may have been popular with his troops, and supported by a few provincial governors in the West, but the rest of the empire was a different story. The backers of Otho were not simply ready to resign themselves to Vitellius. Rather, they cast about looking for a leader to rally behind, someone strong enough to dislodge the Rhine legions from their newly won place at the top of the food chain. Naturally, their eyes turned to the east. Too far away to really take part in the events of the past year, the Eastern Legions, led by Titus Flavius Vespasianus, read about the unfolding chaos with dismay. When Vitellius, of all people, wound up on the throne, Vespasian decided to heed the calls coming in from his fellow Eastern governors to bid for the throne himself. After all, had he not heard the prophecy that the future rulers of the world would emerge from Judea? Embroiled in the great Jewish revolt, in Judea, Vespasian had not only heard the prophecy, but he had come to believe it. Just a month and a half after his so-called decisive victory at Bedriacum, Vitellius discovered that practically the entire Eastern Empire, including the crucial province of Egypt, had declared for Vespasian. Despite Otho's best efforts, the chaos and bloodshed of the year of the four emperors was far from over. 
and welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 72, Vitellius and Vespasian. In April of 69 AD, the Romans watched Vitellius, their fourth emperor in less than a year, ascend to the throne. When Nero had committed suicide, conventional wisdom held that old Galba would reign for a few years and then hand power to an heir, presumably some young man with many years ahead of him. If anything, the death of Nero was supposed to open up a period of stability. But here they were, ten months later, and the Senate was recognizing yet another emperor. There was nothing anyone could really do about it, except hope that this, finally, was the end of it. But it was not to be. Vitellius would not live to see the new year, and before the final emperor of this chaotic period strode into office, there would be more bloodshed, more misery, more betrayal, and more destruction. Though he was of mild disposition and never would have ordered the crimes committed in his name, when the forces of Vespasian stormed into Italy on their way to Rome, they brought with them the worst civil war had to offer. It would be a bloody end to a bloody year. The only silver lining was that it would be an end. Vespasian would reign for years, not months, and his sons for years after that. The luck of the Flavians would see to that. The suicide of Otho had taken everyone by surprise. Friend and foe alike expected the young emperor to fight it out with Vitellius to the bitter end. After going to such extreme lengths to seize power, it was inconceivable that he would simply give up after suffering what could be seen as no more than a minor setback at Bedriacum. But rather than receiving further instructions, the legions that had pledged their loyalty to Otho were simply informed that their leader was dead. And rather than preparing themselves for the next battle, the legions that had pledged their loyalty to Vitellius were simply informed that they had won. No one knew quite what to do next. Vitellius, though, knew exactly what to do. Throw a huge party. The new emperor, not officially designated as such yet, was staying in Lugdunum, the Roman capital of Gaul, when he got the news that Otho was dead. Valens and Caecina were told to make sure their respective armies were in order, and that the enemy was fully subdued, and then they were to make haste to Gaul for an extravagant banquet. When the two generals arrived, they sat on opposite sides of the new emperor at the main table, and everyone got good and drunk, singing each other's praises and mocking the Othonians well into the night. The excesses of the victory celebration would set the tone for Vitellius' reign, or at least the historical depiction of Vitellius' reign, which may or may not be the same thing. The problem for Vitellius is that none of the ancient historians were on his side. The men who recorded the events of the year of the four emperors were obviously writing after Vespasian had emerged victorious, and I think we all know what they say about who gets to write history. Vespasian would have naturally justified his own actions by repeating the worst rumors about Vitellius's excesses in order to portray himself as a savior, and so Roman scholars became steeped in Vespasian's version of who did what to who, why, and how. Tacitus may have published his account well after the death of Domitian, but his early career was influenced by first Vespasian and then Titus, and it is understandable that he portrayed Vitellius in less than glowing terms. But it was not just Flavian propaganda that Vitellius is up against. Suetonius' father fought with the Othonians at Bedriacum, and if you think that the father had anything good to say to the son about the gluttonous usurper from Germania, well, you haven't read Twelve Caesars. This is all to say that the caricature of Vitellius that has been handed down to us may bear only a passing resemblance to the man himself. That being said, though, it sure is a fun caricature, so let's just roll with it. It took Vitellius six weeks to wind his way down to Rome, leading his army from the Rhine on a meandering, debauched road trip. With some 60,000 soldiers, followers, and hangers-on accompanying him, discipline was lax, and the toll taken on the towns they passed high. Along the way, the new emperor detoured to the battlefield at Bedriacum and pronounced the stench of death that still hung over the field sweet to his nose. He then swung by Otho's modest burial site and pronounced it a small grave for a small man. Then he went back to his traveling party and got drunk. See, isn't this Vitellius fun? He finally arrived in Rome in June and had every intention of marching into the capital in full triumphal regalia, 
but was reminded that it would be in really, really poor form to celebrate victory over his fellow Romans, so he entered the gates dressed in a simple civilian toga instead. The actual reign of Vitellius is not particularly well documented, but the general consensus is that while Vitellius banqueted four times a day, attended the races, and then slept it off, Valens and Caecina were left in control of the day-to-day -day operations. Partners in war, however, the two became bitter enemies in peace, and nothing so defined the Vitellian regime as the rivalry between Valens and Caecina. Every appointment, every assignment, every appropriation became a cause worth fighting for. They both stacked the reorganized legions, civil service, and Praetorian Guard with their own clients so that every level of every department became a front in their running political war. In the end, Valens would win the war for influence, leading Caecina to famously betray his third emperor in 15 months. The Vitellian regime was unable to accomplish that much in their brief time at the helm. They raised some taxes, threw some games, and tried to manage four emperors' worth of consular promises in an effort to keep the nobility happy. But between the first battle of Bedriacum in April and the second in October, it's not like they had a lot of time to work with. The only really significant thing they did upon taking office was to disband the existing Praetorian Guard and then reform it using their own troops to ensure that all the Othonian loyalists were purged. This was maybe a good idea, and maybe not, but the final upshot was that all the best troops were siphoned out of the Rhine legions, so when Caecina headed north to face Antonius' invading army, the force he led was not the same army he had led against Otho. Oh, and all those fired Praetorians? When they heard that the legions of the east were promising to topple Vitellius, guess whose banner they all flocked to? So the reformation of the Praetorians may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but all it ultimately did was weaken Vitellius and strengthen Vespasian. So yeah, maybe not such a good idea. Speaking of Vespasian, when we last left him, he was in the process of putting down the great Jewish revolt, specifically contemplating when and how he was going to take Jerusalem. But when news of Nero's suicide arrived, he put the brakes on the campaign, unsure of whether Galba planned to adopt a harsh or lenient posture towards the Jews. Plus, as one of Nero's appointees, he had every reason to fear that Galba would recall him from his post. So he wrote the new emperor a friendly letter, pledging loyalty and requesting instructions. Fearing the worst when Galba ignored his overture, Vespasian sent his 28-year-old son Titus to Rome to feel Galba out. But before Titus could arrive, he received news of Galba's assassination and decided to turn back rather than allow himself to become a pawn in the brewing war between Otho and Vitellius. Vespasian commended his son's decision and then began to mull over what to do. Obviously, he should try to keep himself at arm's length from the conflict between Otho and Vitellius and wait to see how it played out. He was obligated to swear loyalty to Otho, of course, but that did not mean that he had to lift a finger to help him. So Vespasian settled back to wait for further news from the West. While he waited, though, a thought began to form in his head. Back home, every two-bit general with a legion at his disposal was making his bid for power. What makes them so much more qualified than, you know, me? The future king of the world will come from Judea, the prophecy had said. Vespasian was beginning to think that he could make that prophecy come true. But that is not to say that this was all Vespasian's idea. Gaius Licinius Mucianus, the governor of Syria, had gone as high as he could hope to go in public life under existing conditions and was dissatisfied with how low a height it was. Stuck in the largely diplomatic post of Syria, he was in danger of passing his whole life without ever tasting military glory and was determined to rectify that situation. Mucianus saw in the mild, capable, and well-liked Vespasian the perfect vehicle for his ambitions, so he became an early prodder of Vespasian's growing ego and an active supporter once the future emperor finally decided to go for it. The other key prodder of Vespasian was Tiberius Julius Alexander, the Jewish-born prefect of Egypt. Appointed by Nero, events in the West had unfolded too rapidly for either Galba or Otho to replace him.
So he and his two legions continued their administration in Alexandria well into Vitellius's reign. Having no love for Vitellius and knowing full well that the new emperor would likely replace him and possibly execute him at the first opportunity, Alexander began a secret correspondence with Vespasian, pledging his support and his legions if Vespasian decided to, you know, do something. The two legions were nice, but the real prize here was that Egypt was still a key agricultural engine of the empire. Any invasion of Italy that was coupled with a strangling off of the grain supply did not necessarily guarantee victory, see Antony, Mark, but it sure upped the percentages by a healthy margin. Both Mucianus and Alexander were ready to declare for Vespasian immediately, but the future emperor was a deliberate man, and as spring turned to summer, he had still not yet announced whether or not he was going to lead the armies of the East in revolt. The impatient Alexander decided Vespasian just needed a swift kick to get going, so the prefect of Egypt went ahead and administered an oath of loyalty to Vespasian to his legions on July the 1st. A few days later, Vespasian's armies in Judea heard the news, and when their general emerged from his tent, a collection of them casually hailed him as emperor. With the cat now out of the bag, Vespasian decided to let it roam free. On July 15, Mucianus administered the oath to the legions of Syria and went to work convincing the legions in the Balkans to join them. In the process of being punished by Vitellius for their support of Otho, the troops in the Balkans were more than happy to join in the fight. In short order, Vespasian had the whole of the Eastern Empire lined up behind him. Vitellius, meanwhile, was still taking his victory lap. The Flavian plan was for Vespasian to remain behind in the east while Mucianus led an invasion of the west. Taking up residence in Alexandria, Vespasian would be able to personally oversee the all-important province of Egypt while remaining perfectly situated to reinforce his invasion force should they need support. After receiving assurances from the Parthians that they would not stir up trouble along the border, Mucianus set out west with a force of about 18,000 troops. Along the way, he was supposed to pick up the Balkan legions, and then, when he got near Italy, put out the call to the demobilized Othonian troops to flock to Vespasian's banner. But things did not exactly go according to plan. The commanders of the five legions stationed in the Balkans were eager to take their revenge on Vitellius, but not as eager as the troops themselves. The officers stated flatly that the plan was to wait for Mucianus, so that's what they were going to do. Seeing an opportunity to bathe himself in glory, though, Marcus Antonius Primus broke with his colleagues and argued that they should immediately invade Italy while the Vitalian troops were still drunk with victory. The troops couldn't have agreed more and elected Antonius their new general. Instead of waiting for Mucianus to arrive, Antonius went off the reservation and led the legions now under his command into Italy. In other words, the army that ultimately won the war for Vespasian was never authorized to do what it did. When Vitellius learned that a Flavian army was marching on Italy, he dispatched Caecina to stop their advance. The emperor no doubt would have sent Valens as well, but the elder general was recovering from an illness at the time and was unable to make the trip. For Caecina, this presented a golden opportunity. In the months since he had helped Vitellius become emperor, the young noble had found himself increasingly ignored while Valens emerged as the far more influential advisor. Whenever Valens and Caecina disagreed over some issue or another, Vitellius generally backed Valens. Deeply unhappy with his position, Caecina marched north at the head of the Vitellian legions, thinking deeply not about battle plans, but whether or not he should defect to Vespasian. He had already been in contact with the commander of the Vitellian naval fleet stationed at Ravenna, and the commander there had assured Caecina that he was going over to Vespasian at the first opportunity. Caecina, he said, should join him on the winning team. Antonius arrived in Italy with his advance guard in October, and was greeted by a much stronger force led by Caecina. But rather than attack as his men expected, Caecina opened negotiations with Antonius, hinting elliptically that he was willing to betray Vitellius if the terms were right. While he negotiated, the rest of Antonius's troops arrived, negating the numerical advantage that the Vitellians had once had.
leading the men under Caecina's command to wonder just what their general was up to. Not long after that, though, they got their answer. Messengers arrived with the news that the Ravenna fleet had defected to Vespasian. Caecina called together his officers and announced that it was hopeless to fight the Flavian onslaught. The whole empire was turning against Vitellius, and they had better join the winning side before they all found their heads on the chopping block. He managed to convince the officers, but when the regular troops learned of the betrayal, they stormed the tent and threw the shocked and sputtering Caecina into chains. The men elected new generals and abandoned the position they had held near Antonius's base in Verona. Antonius woke up the next morning and discovered the army he thought was about to join him had suddenly disappeared into the night. But not one to delay, Antonius marched straight away for Bedriacum, where he planned to make a camp from which to launch an assault on Cremona, the Vitellian base of operations in North Italy. Caecina's army had already made for Cremona following their general's aborted defection, and now waited nervously for Antonius to arrive. In a few days, the two sides would meet in one of the rarest sites in the ancient world, a night battle. Marching in from the east on October the 24th, Antonius' army was disrupted by a Vitellian cavalry attack, and a brief skirmish ensued that saw the Vitellians driven off. The Flavian army kept marching, but they were unable to reach the full Vitellian force until late in the afternoon. Flush with victory, the Flavians refused to retire from the field. For their part, the Vitellians were so close to the safety of Cremona that they figured that if things got too hairy, they could just make a run for it, so they too refused to retire for the evening. For the next ten hours, the two armies fought a sporadic and bloody battle through the night that was still undecided when the sun rose the next morning. In a quirky twist of fate, though, the Vitellians lost heart when they saw one of the Flavian legions turn east and clearly greet the arrival of reinforcements. Exhausted from the battle, the Vitellians fled back to the safety of Cremona to wait for their own reinforcements. Except that there were no Flavian reinforcements. Having spent years stationed in the east, the legion in question had adopted a local custom of greeting the sun as it rose each morning. At the Second Battle of Bedriacum, the Vitellians were finally defeated not by force, but by a completely harmless religious ritual. Despite their own exhaustion, Antonius' army closed the last few miles to Cremona and laid siege to the city that morning. First, they destroyed the Vitellian camp outside the walls, and then they launched a ferocious assault on the city itself. While the troops and citizens of the city fought off the attack, the officers of the Vitellian army lost hope. They set Caecina loose and begged him to negotiate a peace that would spare their lives. With the leadership of the army protecting them giving up, the civilian leadership of Cremona opened their own talks, and in short order, both the Vitellian legions and the people of Cremona emerged from the city to stand before the victorious Flavians. It was supposed to be a peaceful settlement, one with no sacking, but the tired, bloody, and angry Flavian troops were in no mood to be denied the loot they saw as rightfully theirs. They believed that they had been promised Cremona as a prize for the extreme effort they had just expended in taking it, but it seemed that the officers were now conspiring to deny them their prize. So when Antonius entered the city to take a hot bath, his absence allowed the restraint of his army to slip. 40,000 troops poured into Cremona, grabbing anything that wasn't nailed down and setting fire to the rest. When Vespasian learned what had happened, he denounced the actions of Antonius' army, and as emperor, he tried to rebuild the city, but it would never again rise to the prominence it had enjoyed since its founding just before the Second Punic War. The battle may not have marked the official end of the war, but it certainly dealt a heavy blow to Vitellius' chances. From this point on, practically everything pointed to an emperor destined to fall. Valence had been ordered north about a week after Caecina's departure, but his sluggish pace left him far from Cremona when he learned first of Caecina's attempted defection and then the sack of the city itself. He changed direction and tried to make for Gaul, where he would be able to raise reinforcements. But by this point, practically every governor in the area was pledging allegiance to Vespasian. Valens was captured at sea by former members of Otho's Praetorian Guard, and then sent along to Antonius as a gift-wrapped present. 
Soon enough, Valens's head would be waved before the battalion troops as proof that further resistance was futile. Caecina and Valens had been the driving force behind Vitellius's bid for power, and now one of them had turned on him, and the other was dead. The emperor did not know what to do. He marched out of Rome with most of his new Praetorian guard to make a stand, but upon hearing about more defections throughout the empire, he returned to Rome with half the troops at his disposal, leaving the rest in place to halt the advance of Antonius. As the Flavian army marched south, both Mucianus and Antonius opened up correspondence with Vitellius in an attempt to secure his abdication. They promised him his life, money, and a villa in Campania if he agreed to give up the throne willingly. Vitellius, in way over his head, was eager for the opportunity to get out of all of this with his life. So he took up negotiations with Vespasian's brother Flavius Sabinus, who was living in Rome at the time. But Vitellius's attempt to abdicate was thwarted by his own supporters. On December 18, the emperor gave a speech announcing that he was stepping down, much to the dismay of the loyal troops he still had with him. They had all staked their lives to this man, and now he was simply going to give up? Where did that leave them? So as Vitellius attempted to leave the forum, he was boxed in by members of his own Praetorian guard and marched back to the palace, his resignation annulled by the tip of a spear. Sabinus was at home when he heard of Vitellius' attempted resignation, and he immediately headed down to the forum with an armed guard to issue a proclamation in his brother's name. But along the way, he was surprised to find the Vitellians had not in fact given up. A brief skirmish broke out, and Sabinus was driven up onto the Capitoline Hill, where he and his men barricaded themselves. Over the course of a night and a day, the Vitellian forces attempted to dislodge Sabinus, and in the process, the Temple of Jupiter, one of the most important temples in Rome, was burned to the ground. With the fire raging, the men who had surrounded Sabinus deserted him, and he was eventually captured by the Vitellians and executed. The execution of Vespasian's brother precluded all future negotiations. The army of Antonius, now only miles from Rome, learned of the incident and made straight away for the city. At first, Antonius hesitated, understandably nervous, that attacking Rome itself would irreparably damage Vespasian's, and his own, reputation to the point that even a victory would be a defeat. But his men convinced him that they ought not balk now that the empire was in their hands. Antonius divided his army into thirds and attacked at three different gates. Two of the gates were easily breached, as they were only guarded by an untrained mix of civilian militia. But the fighting at the coal line gate was intense. The outnumbered battalions were eventually pressed back and forced to make a last stand within the Praetorian camp. But despite heavy casualties, the Flavians finally breached the walls, led by the former members of Otho's Praetorian guard, who viewed reclaiming the camp as a matter of personal honor. Vitellius was now all alone. His attempt to give up had failed, and he wandered the deserted imperial palace in shock, trying to figure out what to do next. Eventually, the incoming Flavian army stumbled upon him and took him prisoner. They marched him blubbering through the streets to the steps of lamentation, where he was unceremoniously beheaded as insults rained down upon him. His head was paraded through the city as a trophy, and his body thrown in the Tiber. Vitellius was 54 years old when he died, and had reigned for just over nine months. His death would bring a violent close to a violent year. On the 20th of September, the Senate met and unanimously declared Vespasian emperor. It would be understandable if the no-doubt skittish citizens of the empire were a bit skeptical that this really was an end to the chaos. But as the months passed into years, and no other pretender to the throne arose, they began to get comfortable with the idea that things had sort of returned to normal, that they could fully embrace this new dynasty, the Flavian dynasty. Before we go this week, I just want to mention that Lars Brownworth, whose book I just recommended you buy, is in the process of gauging interest for a lecture tour in early 2010. Since we have so many listeners in common, they've asked me to ask you if anyone in and around Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago, and San Francisco would be interested in such a thing. 
I'm also going to add Austin, Texas to the list because that's where I live now and I think he should come down here. I'll post some links at thehistoryofrome.typepad.com so that you can either email superfan Detlef with your thoughts or sound off at the forum Galorum, the discussion community for the history of Rome that Detlef has set up. Welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 73, The Only Man Who Improved. At the beginning of his histories, Tacitus claims that the year 69 AD was very nearly the last of Rome's existence. While this can be easily set aside as dramatic exaggeration, there is no doubt that the last 18 months had taken their toll on the empire. Lives had been lost, property had been destroyed, and the rule of law had been thrown out the window. It would take more than a year of civil war to destroy the empire, but if things had gone on like they had been going since the suicide of Nero, the Romans very well could have been facing the end of their civilization. Luckily for the Romans, by the time the Senate recognized Vespasian as emperor in the last days of December 69 AD, the civil wars had already swept up all the legions from Spain to Syria and deposited them in Italy to fight it out. Anyone who was in a position to make a bid for the throne had already tried, so there was no one left to perpetuate the cycle of ascension and deposition once Vespasian's forces had overthrown Vitellius. So things did not go on as they had, and Roman civilization survived, battered, but far from beaten. An important thing to take away from this reality is to understand that there was nothing special or divine or cosmic about Vespasian's rise. Unlike Marius or Sulla or Julius Caesar or Augustus, he did not really possess the phenomenal charisma or military brilliance that had allowed those men to outshine their rivals and remake their own world. He simply got into an exhausting tug-of-war later than the others had, and was thus able to outlast the last of them. This is not to say that he wasn't charismatic or intelligent, just that his fortuitous placement in the East at the beginning of the year had as much to do with his success as his own personality. But though he rode a wave of circumstance to power, essentially being in the right place at the right time, Rome's luck would mirror that of their new ruler. Vespasian turned out to be a pretty good emperor. In fact, his unremarkable biography up to that point prompted Tacitus to report that Vespasian was the only emperor in history to improve himself upon taking office. The first few weeks of his reign, however, did nothing to presage the moderate administration that he would be remembered for. Antonius's army had taken Rome by force, and unchecked by any higher power, the troops continued to run amuck in the streets. The Praetorian Guard and the urban cohorts, who usually took the lead in maintaining law and order, were all either captured out on the frontiers or dead in the field. So there was no one to stand up to Antonius's army, as they treated Rome as if it was a captured enemy city. On top of everything, career criminals and citizens with old scores to settle masqueraded as Flavian soldiers and joined in the anarchic pillaging. Tacitus exaggerates when he says that 50,000 people were killed in those first bloody weeks, but there is no denying that the death toll would have been high. Things began to settle down when Mucianus arrived in the first week of January 70 AD. Antonius had been acting this whole time on his own initiative, and though the Flavian High Command had been smart enough to get out of the way of the man who was winning the war for them, that did not mean that Antonius represented Vespasian in any official or political sense. Mucianus, however, carried with him the seal of the new emperor, and was fully empowered to act in Vespasian's name. When he arrived with his armies, it was as if Vespasian himself had arrived, and Mucianus had both the ability and the ego to act the part. The first thing that needed to happen, obviously, was to get all the troops out of Rome. The city had been occupied for months by squatting legionaries, and the resulting chaos, death, and property damage had to be dealt with. <laughs> 
Antonius's legions were either ordered back from whence they came, or, in a few cases, reassigned to the Rhine to help bolster the now weakened garrison there. With order restored, Mucianus set about consolidating Vespasian's political position. Or, I suppose I should really say, Mucianus set about consolidating Mucianus's political position, and then he took care of Vespasian's business. He rewarded Antonius's service by offering him Galba's old proconsular position in Spain, quickly removing one of the two key rivals for power he needed to neutralize before he felt secure in his position. The other key rival was 18-year-old Domitian, the youngest son of Vespasian, who had spent the year of the four emperors in Rome. Immediately following Vitellius's death, Flavian supporters had brought the boy out of hiding, declared him Caesar, and paraded him around as their natural leader. When Mucianus arrived in the city, though, he placed Domitian under his personal protection and promised to keep the boy safe until his father arrived to collect him. In other words, don't anybody get confused. I'm in charge here, not the boy. Then he set to work, settling Vespasian's scores. In all of this, the new emperor was blessed by remaining physically absent from the city. He could thus plausibly disavow first the carnage wrought by Antonius' army, and then the purge overseen by Mucianus. It had taken a lot of blood to put Vespasian on the throne, but none of it actually wound up on his hands. When he finally arrived in Rome in mid to late 70, he was greeted warmly by a population who praised him for all that was good while refusing to blame him for all that was bad. All in all, a nice place to be. Now, I just said that there was nothing really remarkable about Vespasian, and that he certainly wasn't on the level of Julius Caesar or Augustus in terms of overall ability. But if there was one realm that he did excel at, it was propaganda and the management of public perception. In this, he was every bit as savvy as the greatest of his predecessors. He was acutely aware of the need to legitimize his reign and restore public respect for imperial authority, which was practically non-existent now after the musical chairs of the previous year. He encouraged the spread of Eastern prophecies that had supposedly foretold his rise to power, and did nothing to dispel rumors that he had miraculously returned sight to a blind man and restored the withered legs of a cripple. Vespasian knew that he was just a man, but it was important for the people to believe that he was perhaps something a bit more. Beyond this subtle mysticism, the iconography of the coins minted during his reign one of the key vehicles for massaging reality in ancient Rome, harped relentlessly on two themes, peace and victory. Vespasian is the one who brings you peace. Vespasian is the one who will defeat the enemies of peace. These powerfully simple ideas formed the bedrock of the new Flavian administration and helped put the dark days of civil war in the rearview mirror. But Vespasian added one further wrinkle to his propaganda campaign, and it was this final wrinkle that really endeared him to the people. Though he encouraged the belief that he could heal the sick or was an irresistible force destined to rule the empire, when you actually talked to the man, he was refreshingly self-deprecating. He knew he was not descended from some ancient line of nobility. He knew that he was an unrefined rustic, and he knew that he was too old to pretend to be otherwise. When some of his supporters presented him with a family tree that traced his ancestors back to one of the comrades of Hercules, Vespasian simply burst out laughing and sent them on their way. He liked to tell off-color jokes, eat simple foods, and even caused a minor scandal when it got out that he took his own boots off in the evening. Needless to say, after the sometimes waning but usually waxing megalomania of the Julio-Claudians, Vespasian's down-home charm was a welcome change of pace. Of course, we know all of this because, as part of his propaganda campaign, Vespasian also made sure to patronize the heck out of the arts and letters. He put teachers on the public payroll for the first time and commissioned histories to be written to ensure that the Flavian version of history would become the only version taught. So who knows where fact and fiction diverge, but we do know that Vespasian was the first emperor since Augustus to die of natural causes, so it is not unreasonable to think that he was well regarded in his own time. Ironically, though, as much as he sponsored scholars to write glowing histories of his rise to power and what he did when he got there, 
Precious Little has actually survived about Vespasian's time as emperor. He was in office from December 69 AD until his death in June of 79, and all we have to draw on to describe that decade are scattered anecdotes. What we do know is that his reign seems to have been focused on physically rebuilding the empire and setting the government back on firm financial footing. To take the latter point first, Vespasian inherited an empty treasury and a shattered tax code and aimed to do something about it. Rome had been grappling with the hangover from Nero's excesses when it had gone and tacked on a year's worth of civil war to the tab. Upon taking office, Vespasian estimated that he would need, quote, 40,000 million sesterces to get the empire back on its feet. Because it is nearly impossible to accurately convert ancient denominations to modern equivalents, we're just going to have to leave that as Vespasian was about to go hunting for an astronomical sum of money. He doubled the tax burden in the provinces, which, yeah, I think everyone saw that coming. But he also engaged in some pretty unseemly business practices that stood as the only real blemish on his record. For example, the emperor didn't think twice about accepting bribes to decide court cases this way or that, and he openly encouraged office seekers to deposit into the imperial treasury an amount that they felt quantified their desire for a given post. Vespasian was also fond of using his agents to corner the market on various scarce goods and then jacking up the price once a monopoly had been achieved. And in perhaps his most diabolical scheme, the emperor would let loose corrupt tax collectors and look the other way as they extorted the population to their own financial advantage. Then, when the collector had gotten rich enough, Vespasian would suddenly discover their fraud and swoop in to punish the criminal and seize the ill-gotten assets. The pattern repeated itself enough that the people began to refer to these men as Vespasian sponges, who would soak up all the gold before being wrung out by the emperor. He also dreamed up new taxes that hit the usually exempt citizens of Italy. Perhaps the most famous of these was his so-called toilet tax. In ancient Rome, urine was deposited in huge cesspools and then resold by the collectors for a variety of industrial applications. Vespasian imposed a tax on the purchase of said urine, which ignited an outcry that eventually wound its way back to Vespasian by way of his son Titus. Arguing to his father that there was something a bit off about using sewer money, Vespasian smelled the coins Titus had brought along and famously declared that money does not stink, which more or less summed up Vespasian's whole attitude towards revenue generation. But though no one liked how he got the money, Vespasian's reputation did not suffer too much, as he always plowed the profits right back into the empire. Though his infrastructure projects could be seen as an extension of his public relations campaign, there is no denying that both within Rome and out in the provinces, good work was being done to improve the material lives of the citizens. Between the neglect of Nero and the civil wars that followed his death, the Eternal City itself was beginning to look like a crumbling shadow of its former self. Vespasian encouraged the rebuilding of damaged buildings, allowed new owners to take control of forgotten vacant lots, while he himself took the lead in repairing the burned-out Capitoline Hill and finishing construction on the abandoned Temple of Claudius. His crowning achievement, though, was his plan for the remains of Nero's Golden Palace. The sprawling complex that had eaten away the heart of the city was dismantled, and in its place, Vespasian ordered the construction of a massive amphitheater. Rising from the drained bed of Nero's old private lake, what became known as simply the Colosseum took shape over the next decade, and though he would not live to see the completion of what the Romans called the Flavian Amphitheater, when the stadium was dedicated by his son Titus in 80 AD, it quickly became one of the most famous architectural achievements in history. But he did not simply focus on Rome itself. Vespasian was quick to send money and resources whenever some region or another was hit with a natural disaster, so that rather than being left to fend for themselves, the victims of floods, fires, and earthquakes found a friend in the emperor. After years of enduring a reclusive and disinterested Tiberius, a megalomaniacal Caligula, and admittedly decent Claudius, but then a cruelly self-absorbed Nero, Vespasian's actions were nothing short of a political and fiscal revolution. 
For Vespasian, it was an easy call. Using the imperial treasury for the material benefit of the empire conformed with his compassionate nature, but it also conformed with his pragmatic nature, because usually a small investment was all that was required to keep the people happy and paying their taxes. Vespasian's pragmatic compassion extended up and down the social classes and earned him praise from commoner and noble alike. After the chaotic splintering of the upper classes during the civil wars, the ranks of the senatorial and equestrian orders was a confused mess. So Vespasian reorganized the ranks to reflect a post-year of the four emperors reality. But rather than solidifying his rule by executing his enemies and packing the senate with corrupt supporters, he seems to have followed a program of leaving virtuous men in place and removing the worst of the worst, whoever they had supported during the wars. He even took it a step further by extending financial aid to otherwise worthy senators who had fallen beneath the asset requirements for office. Having stabilized the upper classes, he then took a hands-off approach to their debates and encouraged men to say their piece honestly without fear of imperial reprisal. Vespasian never introduced anything resembling the treason trial so loved by the hypersensitive Julio-Claudians, commenting once about a particularly vocal Helvidius Priscus that he would not kill a dog simply for barking. Of course, the irrepressible Priscus had to keep pushing to see just how far he could go, and in 75, Vespasian was forced to banish him from Rome. Eventually, the dissident Stoic would be executed by Titus, but he was a particularly troubling pain in the rear end, and definitely the exception rather than the rule. Vespasian's decade in office is usually understood to have been one of peace at home and abroad. Certainly, the coins he minted drove home the idea that all was well and the empire was at peace. But in reality, in the beginning anyway, Vespasian could not escape the entropy that always pulls at the edges of empire. In Judea, the revolt Vespasian had been assigned to put down did not stop simply because he had turned his attention westward. In fact, with the Roman world in crisis, Jewish leaders redoubled their efforts, believing that now was the perfect time to drive off the distracted legions. But unfortunately for the Jews, Rome was more than able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Vespasian assigned his more than capable son Titus to take over operations in Judea, and in 70 AD, just months after his father became emperor, Titus began the final siege of Jerusalem. Surrounding the city with his four legions, Titus cut off supplies going into the city and then opened negotiations for a peaceful surrender. But the scene inside of Jerusalem was ugly. The Jewish leadership was fractured, and infighting between the moderate and extreme elements led to a toxic atmosphere of mutual assassination and terrorist attacks. At one point, the food stores were torched by hardline anti-Romans who believed the loss of their security blanket would force the moderates to fight to the death. By May, Titus was done talking and crashed through one of the outer walls. Intense street fighting followed, with the Jews left alive falling behind the secondary walls near the Temple Mount. But the Romans finally overcame these last defenders, and by September, the entire city was in their hands. History records that at this point, the Roman soldiers, enraged at the ordeal the Jews had just put them through, plundered the city mercilessly and set fire to the rest, including, against Titus's explicit orders, the great temple itself. Josephus, who was present with Titus at the time, reports that over the course of the siege, over a million people died, and another hundred thousand were taken prisoner. The great Jewish revolt was broken. However, a few pockets of resistance still existed, and after Titus was recalled to Rome to serve as his father's colleague, a deputy was put in charge of mop-up duties. The most famous of these pockets was, of course, the fortress at Masada, garrisoned by 960 Sicarii fighters. The fortress, situated atop a high mesa, was nearly impregnable, and it took a full year's worth of rampart building for the Romans to even reach the walls. On April 16, 73 AD, though, the Romans finally broke down the gate with a battering ram and, to their surprise, found the entire population of Masada dead from an apparent mass murder-suicide pact to avoid capture and slavery. 
The siege of Masada quickly entered into the Jewish collective consciousness and has held a prominent place there ever since. Today, beyond its popularity as a tourist destination, the Israeli Defense Force holds its basic training graduation at the ruins of the fortress, where their newly inducted soldiers swear to never allow Masada to fall again. On the other side of the empire, Vespasian inherited a short-lived, but arguably more serious revolt in Gaul. When Vitellius decided to use the soldiers under his command to invade Italy, he left the Rhine River severely undermanned, and local tribal leaders were not about to miss their opportunity to break away from Roman rule. Specifically, a hereditary prince of the Batavians named Julius Cavillus, who had been made a citizen of Rome previously as a reward for 25 years' service in the legion, decided that he had had enough of the Romans. The Batavians had long enjoyed exemption from taxation in exchange for providing a disproportionate share of the auxiliary troops stationed along the Rhine, but as Vitellius ascended to the throne, his agents pressed the Batavians to contribute even more troops to help reinforce the Rhine. This was the last straw for the Batavians, who were already ticked off at the empire for a number of other recent slights, and in the guise of helping Vespasian win the throne, Julius Cavillus led his people in revolt. He helped pin down the two legions left on the Lower Rhine, and thus did indeed help Vespasian's war effort. But when the Flavians emerged victorious, and Cavillus refused to lift his siege, it became apparent that the Batavians were fighting for themselves alone. Elsewhere in Gaul, a Belgic leader who claimed to be the great-grandson of Julius Caesar led his own revolt and managed to convince the two legions garrisoning the area to come over to his side. With the whole region up in arms and expecting little relief, the commanders of the two legions besieged by Cavillus surrendered in early 70 AD. But contrary to the promise of safe passage they had received, the two disarmed legions were massacred. Obviously, Rome could not stand for such an atrocity, and the shocked Vespasian, who had already promised the Batavians independence as a reward for their help against Vitellius, ordered a massive army north to crush the rebellion. Cavillus planned to keep fighting, but when word came that Jerusalem had fallen, he knew that the handwriting was on the wall. The Batavian leader had been counting on the continued Roman preoccupation in the east to help him avoid the full brunt of the empire's attention. But now that he knew that he and his countrymen were the only things blipping on Vespasian's radar, it was time to give up. The Batavians surrendered and agreed to return to the terms of their original treaty, along with a whole host of new restrictions and obligations. Beyond the unrest of his first years in office, the empire was relatively quiet throughout Vespasian's reign. The only major action thereafter took place in Britain, which we'll cover more extensively next week as it spanned the reigns of Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. We are blessed to have a full accounting of the campaigns in Britannia, as Tacitus married the daughter of the principal Roman commander, Julius Agricola, and chose his father-in-law as the subject of his first major historical work, known as the Agricola. Vespasian, as I said, was the first emperor in quite some time to die of natural causes, which is a testament to the esteem with which he was held. That is not to say that various attacks weren't made on his life, just that none were able to get close enough to be dangerous. The Praetorians remained loyal, and top commanders refused to get caught up with plots to overthrow a popular ruler. I will mention, though, as an epilogue to the Year of the Four Emperors, that one of the men who did attempt to assassinate Vespasian was none other than Caecina who was apparently hardwired to betray whatever master he served. Despite earning Vespasian's favor during the war, by 79, Caecina was up to his old tricks again. For unknown reasons, he conspired to kill the emperor, but the plot was discovered, and the habitual turncoat was finally executed by Titus. Vespasian survived all of this easily, but by June of 79, his health began to slip. At 69 years old, he was not a young man anymore and knew that his time was at hand. He had brought Titus in to share the burden of empire years before and was confident he was handing power over to a capable man who could rule for many years, at least long enough for him to sire his own son and keep power away from Vespasian's other son, Domitian, 
a young man of dubious character. On June 23, 79 AD, Vespasian lay on his deathbed. But rather than simply fading away, he demanded that he be helped out of bed, declaring that an emperor should at least die on his feet. According to the legend, his last words, spoken while enduring the painful throes of death, were, Dear me, I must be becoming a god. Vespasian died at the age of 69 after ruling Rome for nine and a half years. Vespasian's reign is generally seen as a successful one, and I see no reason to contradict the consensus. His naturally mild temperament, pragmatic policies, and skillful use of propaganda allowed normalcy to return to an empire shaken by civil war. In almost every way, he left Rome better than he had found it, and as Tacitus said, he was probably the only man who improved his own character upon taking office. This rustic and obscure general had gone far higher than he had any right to expect, and he had clearly risen to the occasion. Not only that, but Titus had risen to the occasion along with his father, and despite some initial misgivings about their new emperor, the people of Rome quickly embraced Titus and began to hail the new Flavian dynasty as the answer to all their problems. Unfortunately, Titus would last only a scant two years in office before succumbing to disease, and soon enough, the Romans would be introduced to the dark half of the Flavian coin. Welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 74, Friends, I Have Wasted a Day. Titus Flavius Vespasianus, the eldest son of Vespasian, ascended to the throne in June 79 AD following the sad but not entirely unexpected death of his father. The Roman world had settled down considerably under Vespasian's moderate influence, and though there may have been a few scattered anxieties concerning the transfer of power, after all, it had been 25 years since power had last been transferred peacefully. No one arose to challenge Titus, who was, in every way, the legal and logical heir to the throne. In fact, most people were not worried at all about whether the transition from Vespasian to Titus would be peaceful, but rather, whether Titus would follow in his father's mild footsteps, or whether he would become a tyrant, drunk with power. Because though he is remembered today for continuing the pragmatic moderation of his father, and possibly even besting him in the department of generosity, when the almost 40-year-old Titus was hailed as Augustus, there were very real fears that, despite his age, he would prove himself to be another Nero. But before we get too deep into the biography of Titus, I want to double back and hit on something I left hanging last week when I was describing the relative peace of Vespasian's reign. Though the revolts in Judea and Gaul were put down soon after Vespasian took office, the one theater of war that remained active throughout most of his reign, and into those of his sons, was up in Britannia. We know this, as I said last week, because the commander who led most of the campaigns in the north had the good sense to marry his daughter to a world-class historian. As a result, we probably know more about what Nius Julius Agricola was up to during the reign of Vespasian than we know about what the emperor himself was up to. Agricola was born on the southern coast of Gaul in 40 AD into a family of senatorial rank on both sides. He did not get to know his father very well, however, as the elder Agricola was executed by Caligula for refusing to prosecute someone who had raised the mad emperor's ire. The younger Agricola escaped Caligula's wrath, and when he turned 18, he began his public career by getting shipped off in 58 AD to the island that would define his life. Agricola arrived in Britannia just in time to serve as a military tribune on the general staff during Boudicca's revolt. When the uprising was put down, Agricola was transferred to the province of Asia, and it was while in the east that his wife gave birth to Julia Agricola, future wife of our old friend Tacitus. Back in Rome, after his term expired in 66, 
He managed to escape the year of the four emperors with his head intact, but was crushed to learn that Otho's marauding naval force had killed his mother while they sacked the Gallic coast. Probably blaming both Otho and Vitellius alike for causing the war that had killed his mother, Agricola eagerly joined the Flavians the first chance he got. Vespasian recognized Agricola's promise, and after taking office, assigned him to lead a legion in Britannia, a province the young man was already well acquainted with. The imperial administration on the island had been plunged into a state of disarray by the recent civil wars, with the various legionary commanders being pulled different directions, while all the while remaining too far away to do anything about, or keep up with, the rapid-fire changeover of power down in Rome. A dissident faction of Brigantes, the largest pro-Roman tribe on the island, decided to take advantage of the situation and overthrew their collaborating queen, who, just to bring things back around, was the same queen who had once upon a time handed Caraticus to the Romans when the resistance leader came looking for sanctuary in 51. Suddenly, the Romans' greatest ally became their greatest threat. And when he took over, Vespasian appointed a vigorous governor to get the situation back in hand, and the governor in turn appointed Agricola to spearhead the repacification. From 71 to 75, Agricola crisscrossed Brigante's territory, attempting to bring it back to heel. He was successful, but not definitively, and the region would continue to plague the empire for years to come. Eventually, the Emperor Hadrian would build the wall that bears his name, in part to separate the Brigantes from supply lines and allies in Scotland. After receiving a promotion to a governorship in Gaul in 75, and then serving in Rome as a consul, Agricola returned to Britannia for a third time in 78, this time as the provincial governor, a post he would hold for an unusually long seven years. The new governor's first task was to retaliate against one of the eternally difficult Welsh tribes who had annihilated a Roman cavalry garrison and were now openly flouting Roman rule. Agricola swept in and easily crushed the offending tribe and restored firm Roman control of the region in the process. The whole province had been suffering from a string of disinterested Roman administrators who were likely no more happy about being stuck in Britain than the locals were about being stuck with them. But Agricola was determined to remind everyone, Romans and British alike, that the empire was here to stay. He quickly gained a reputation as a strict administrator of both unruly locals and unruly legionaries. But no one could deny that he was always honest in his dealings with both his soldiers and the tribes they watched over. In an effort to further entrench Roman civilization on the island, Agricola instituted programs to educate the sons of the local nobility in proper classical fashion, exposing them to ideas far beyond what their parents could possibly understand, and hopefully turning the next generation of leaders into true Roman citizens, rather than leaving them as uncouth provincials. He also tried to replace the messily organic town centers with the straight-lined rationality of Roman city planning. His theory was that if the British locals thought like Romans and lived like Romans, pretty soon they would be Romans. That was the idea, anyway. Agricola's vision of a fully Romanized Britain never did come to fruition, but it was not for a lack of trying. In a few short years, Agricola would find himself leading an army north into Scotland in an attempt to bring the whole island under imperial control. Though he would defeat a combined force of some 30,000 Caledonians in 84 AD, and possibly marched all the way to the north coast, the Romans never would gain a foothold in the highlands, and Hadrian would eventually give up the ghost for good, building his wall to separate civilization from the trackless wilds of the north. But now I'm getting ahead of myself rather than trying to play catch-up. While Agricola was still in Britain, Vespasian died, and his son Titus, who had likely served alongside Agricola during Boudicca's revolt, ascended to the throne. Both men were about the same age, just shy of their 40th birthdays, and if Titus lived as long as his 70-year-old father, that meant that the empire had just bought itself 30 years of stability. But the merciless fates would conspire to rob Rome of their enormously popular new emperor in just two years, and leave them instead with Titus's far less popular brother Domitian, 
Domitian would reign for 15 possibly misunderstood years before being deposed in 96 AD, permanently ending the Flavian dynasty, which most figured would have barely gotten going by that point. But rather than opening another round of destructive chaos as the fall of the Julio-Claudians had done, the fall of the Flavians ushered in the golden age of imperial Rome. The so-called five good emperors who ruled from 96 AD until Marcus Aurelius foolishly handed power to his son Joaquin Phoenix in 180, wisely governed Rome to the height of its power, prestige, and glory. But I'm getting ahead of myself again, so without further ado, on to the short, happy reign of Titus Flavius Vespasianus. Titus was born in 39 AD and was raised in Rome in the shadow of the imperial court. He was a friend and schoolmate of Claudius' brother Britannicus, and Suetonius goes so far as to report that Titus was by his friend's side when Britannicus drank Nero's poison in 55 AD. Young Titus showed enormous promise and excelled at both oratory and sports. He began his public career as soon as he could, and in 57 AD was elected military tribune, the first step up the cursus honorum, and was assigned to a post in Germania. Two years later, he was transferred to his father's old stomping ground in Britannia to aid in the suppression of Boudicca's revolt, where, as I said, he likely served alongside Agricola, though whether the two actually knew each other at this point is debatable. In 63, he returned to Rome and married for the first time, but his wife died in 65 after bearing him a daughter. He remarried in 65, but the family of his second wife was deeply involved in the Pisonian conspiracy against Nero, and Titus prudently sued for divorce. Curiously, for a man of his time, Titus never again remarried, though he was not without romantic company, as we will soon see. When Vespasian was assigned by Nero to suppress the Jewish revolt in late 66 AD, he took his 27-year-old son with him to serve on staff. The young man distinguished himself not only as a strategist and tactician, but also as a diplomat. As we now know, the governor of Syria, Mucianus, was a key early supporter of Vespasian's bid for the throne, but initially the two men had gotten off on the wrong foot. Vespasian took his orders to mean that he had overall command of the east and could do whatever came into his head as long as it meant winning the war in Judea, even if it meant encroaching into what Mucianus felt was his ultimate authority in Syria. Vespasian sent Titus to Antioch to soothe Mucianus' ruffled feathers, and the young commander was so successful that Mucianus not only dropped his complaints, but became a staunch Flavian supporter. This was no doubt at the forefront of Vespasian's mind when he sent Titus to meet with Galba after the latter's non-response to Vespasian's friendly overtures in 68 AD. Who knows, Titus might make such an impression on the new emperor that Galba will be inclined to adopt him as heir. But as we noted, Titus had only made it as far as Greece before Galba was assassinated, and he quickly returned to the safety of the east. When Vespasian decided to follow the advice of his new BFF Mucianus and accept the title of emperor in mid-69, he handed responsibility for the Jewish revolt to Titus, who, as we saw last week, brought it to a swift conclusion. With the main action over, Titus followed his father back to Rome, and when he arrived, was awarded a full triumph for his smashing victory in Jerusalem. Vespasian decided to keep Titus close by his side in Rome and involve him in every aspect of imperial administration. It was a foregone conclusion that Titus would be emperor himself one day and needed the experience, but Vespasian also needed someone he could trust implicitly right there by his side. Though history records Vespasian's reign as one relatively free from internal dissent, there was no guarantee at the beginning that this was going to be the case. Titus was not only given the title Caesar, along with his younger brother Domitian, but he also shared in his father's tribunician power, served as imperial secretary, and perhaps most important of all, was made prefect of the Praetorian Guard. If there was one lesson to be learned from the previous year's unrest, it was that the emperor must watch the guard as vigilantly as they watched him. With Titus serving as prefect, 
Vespasian could be sure to remain one step ahead of any palace coup. The problem for Titus, and the reason there were some misgivings about his ascension, is that all of this cast him in the role of enforcer of imperial will. He was the bad cop to Vespasian's good cop, and Titus quickly gained a reputation for uncompromising ruthlessness. When he did ferret out a plot here or a conspiracy there, he did not hesitate to execute or exile the scheming parties involved, as was the case with Caecina near the end of Vespasian's reign. The lack of due process that accompanied the execution of suspected enemies of the state led many to naturally fear what Titus would do once he ruled in his own right. His alleged cruel streak was then coupled with a growing reputation as a cavorting hedonist. He isn't even married, the scandalized chattering classes fretted. And a caricature soon emerged of Titus as the reincarnation of Nero. Adding to his image problem was the fact that while he had been posted in the East, he had begun a relationship with the Jewish queen Berenice, who had been driven out of Judea when the revolt began in 66. The two remained romantically attached for years, and in 75 she traveled to Rome to live with the man who was her husband in all but legal title. This was too much for the Romans, however, whose feelings about temptuous eastern queens has been well documented. Finally bowing to public pressure, Titus ended his relationship and sent Berenice back to the east. After he became emperor, she attempted to return to his side in Rome, but he ordered her away again, unwilling to risk the political fallout that was sure to accompany her arrival. But though he was not trusted by the nobility and was not particularly popular with the masses, when he succeeded his father in 79, Titus quickly proved all worries about his character totally baseless. He had played the bad cop because that is what his father required, and his reputation as a Dionysian prince was revealed to have been a gross exaggeration. He was every bit as self-confident as his father had been, leading to the same sort of rational, not insane policies that were fast becoming the hallmark of the Flavian dynasty. In a move 180 degrees removed from the doubters' assumptions about him, Titus took the step of formally abolishing the treason courts, which had been disdained by his father, but were still officially on the books as a legal possibility. He even went so far as to punish potential informants who came by the palace looking to peddle juicy gossip in exchange for favors. Rather than hedonistic cruelty, Titus displayed the exact opposite at every turn, and was lauded by contemporaries and historians alike for his generous spirit. According to the legend, he famously remarked one evening, after realizing he had done no one any favors that day, Friends, I have wasted a day. Of course, his sterling historical reputation is aided by the brevity of his term in office. Cassius Dio, writing a hundred years after his death, made the point of contrasting Titus with Augustus, stating that while Augustus never would have been so loved had he lived a shorter life, Titus never would have been so loved had he lived a longer one. Titus is also helped by the fact that his actions supposedly contrast sharply with those of his monstrous brother Domitian, who was universally derided by the ancient historians. As we'll see next week, Domitian probably wasn't as bad as he is made out to be, but the senatorial historians certainly had an axe to grind with him, and building Titus up into some super wonderful dreamboat was probably a part of that process. This is not to diminish Titus too much, just to say that when it comes to judging him, we have a pretty small sample size to work with and a pretty biased panel of judges. An early test of his character came in either August or October 79 AD, depending on who you talk to, when Mount Vesuvius, situated off the Bay of Naples, suddenly erupted, burying the surrounding countryside in 60 feet of ash and volcanic rock. Famously, the resort town of Pompeii was utterly destroyed, but we should not forget that numerous Campanian cities perished at the same time. It is estimated that somewhere between 10 and 25,000 people lost their lives, including Pliny the Elder, the great naturalist who died attempting a rescue operation in the aftermath of the initial blast. Though the disaster was, of course, a great tragedy, 
Today, we remember Pompeii primarily for the archaeological ruins that were left behind. The volcanic fallout turned the resort town into a near-perfect time capsule, and a great deal of our understanding about daily life in first century Rome comes from the preserved remains. Pompeii remains high on my list of places to visit before I die. Titus, however, did not dwell on what a marvelous archaeological site had just been created, and was quick to appoint two ex-consuls to lead a relief effort, and donated huge sums out of the imperial treasury to aid with first the cleanup and then the reconstruction of the devastated area. He was able to visit the ruined site of Pompeii twice before he died, and it was on that second visit that another disaster struck that again proved Titus's generosity of spirit. In the spring of 80 AD, a huge fire broke out that, while it did not match the Great Fire in sheer destructive force, did serious damage to the capital and felled a number of important buildings, including the original Pantheon that had been built by Marcus Agrippa. Titus rushed back to the city and once again set the full weight of the imperial treasury to the task of helping the victims. His response to these crises endeared him to the Romans at all levels of society as natural disasters of this sort do not distinguish between social classes and everyone needed the emperor's help. His popularity then soared when he was able to complete the Colosseum and adjacent Flavian Baths by that summer, inaugurating the Grand Stadium with a hundred days of games, gladiatorial matches, exotic animal hunts, and chariot races. Exhausted from dealing with their burned-out city, the population was eager for a distraction from their problems, and Titus obliged them splendidly. On the last day of the inaugural games, Titus formally dedicated the so-called Flavian Amphitheater in what would prove to be his final official act as emperor. In September of 81 AD, just a short distance from Rome, the traveling emperor was forced to put in at a way station after coming down with an infection. On September 13th, just two years into a reign that most figured would last for a generation, Titus succumbed to his ailment. His last words were the enigmatic, I have made but one mistake. Much has been made about what the dying emperor could have meant, with suggestions including his impious entrance into the Holy of Holies during the sack of Jerusalem, beginning his improper relationship with Queen Berenice, abruptly ending said relationship with Queen Berenice, conducting a secret affair with Domitian's wife, or a favorite of later historians, not killing Domitian, when the latter was discovered supposedly plotting against his brother. We'll never know for sure what Titus was referring to, because, well, he died right after uttering his delightfully self-confident epitaph. But just for fun, sometimes I like to imagine it as something ridiculously trivial. Like maybe he was remembering the time he forgot to bring wine to a dinner party. And so, while everyone is looking around for some huge revelation in his cryptic rosebudding, Titus was actually just talking about the time he got caught in the rain without an umbrella. But I digress. The unmarried Titus had no male heirs to pass the throne to, and his relative youth had made worrying about succession seem somewhat morbid. So the throne fell to his younger brother Domitian. Domitian had been living for years with a massive inferiority complex that he suffered as a result of being the practically forgotten son of Vespasian, and he was eager to hold power in his own right, mourning his elder brother only briefly before hurrying to the Praetorian camp to seal the emperorship that had just fallen in his lap. Though he held the title of Caesar since the fall of Vitellius, Domitian had been relegated by his father to a merely ceremonial place within the government, and Vespasian virtually ignored his younger son, putting all his time and energy into Titus. Though Titus had promised to include Domitian in his own administration, he died before he could properly follow through on his promise. So in one fell swoop, Rome lost a mature emperor with extensive military, diplomatic, and administrative experience, and gained in his place an immature emperor with no experience and a chip on his shoulder. Domitian was not unintelligent, and as untested, pampered princes go, he was not that bad. At least, he was interested in the hard work of empire. But he also jealously guarded his power, and dispensed with the facade of democracy that previous emperors had been so careful to maintain.
Is it any wonder, then, that the men who wrote the history of the empire, all men of senatorial rank, did their best to confine Domitian to the dustbin of history?